The lecture will be given by Professor Roy Kerr. He came all the way from New Zealand. Yeah. So uh, we appreciate that very, very much. And Professor Roy Kerr is a mathematician and also have been working on general relativity. He is very famous. He got many awards like Einstein medal and uh, various prizes in many countries. But I think that for a scientist, uh, the biggest prize is not that you get some award, but biggest prize is when your name stays in science as a name of something important. And this is the case with Professor Roy Kerr, who I think 55 years ago found certain solution of Einstein's equations, which is now called the Kerr matrix. So this is one place where his name uh, is being used. And also this is related to so-called Kerr black holes. And there are several other objects which uh, bear the name of, of Kerr. So I think this is the measure of how a uh, big scientist he is. So, well, it is just my pleasure to introduce him. And the title of the lecture is, as we see, quasars, black holes, and gravitational waves. Thank you. <laughs> Let me just see whether, yeah, things are working. Okay, what I'm going to talk about is mostly uh, uh, quasars and other objects which we believe are associated with uh, black holes in the universe. I'll also give a few words to the younger people as to how much they should believe their professors and when they're told how the universe operates. I'll save those for the end. Now, when did relativity start? It really started in 1887 with the Michelson-Morley experiment. And this, uh, this was a pretty straightforward experiment. The idea was the Earth is moving in the ether. In those days, they believed there was a permanent ether that uh, everything was moving in. Since the Earth was moving around the Sun, at least in some part of that, it must be moving in the ether, and so they wanted to measure the velocity. And so they took a light source, split it into two beams, compared the results, uh, the distances that they traveled, and they should have been able to, uh, to measure some sort of velocity from that. In fact, as you as all physics students know, the velocity was zero. It didn't matter at which point in the Earth's travel they measured the velocity, it was zero. And of course, this took quite a bit of explaining, but within 20 years, Einstein had brought out his theory of special relativity, which... Uh, uh, in which nothing moves faster than light. Light, uh, uh, basically, it's a theory of the invariances of the physical equations. Now, <coughs> then Einstein brought out, it took him another 10 years, but he produced a theory of gravitation. The, uh, the, the Einstein theory. In this, it, it, he said that uh, that uh, matter causes gravity, and that the geometry says how the matter is going to move, and the matter in the geometry says what shape the geometry is going to have. Now. <coughs> It was pretty, pretty easy for him to do a, a, uh, an approximate solution of those equations to show that, uh, that, for instance, the perihelion of Mercury um, effect was explained by his theory. What the perihelion of Mercury was was that the Mercury moves in an ellipse around the sun and this ellipse slowly rotates, about 42 seconds of arc per, six, per century. That 42 seconds 
couldn't be explained by any Newtonian theory or, in, or the motion of other planets in the solar system. But <coughs> Einstein's theory gave it exactly straight away. And at that point, he was sure he had the right theory. Now, the equations were pretty ghastly, so Einstein didn't think that his equa equations would be solved because they were so nonlinear. But in fact, Carl Schwarzschild very quickly found the solution for a uh, spherically symmetric body. That's just a ball sitting there, not rotating, nothing else in the universe, just that one ball. This corresponds to the inverse square law of Newton, except there were modifications because this wasn't Newton's theory, it was Einstein's theory. <coughs> now, the thing about that equation, which is the only reason I put it up for here, is that it had a factor 1 minus 2m over r, and it had the inverse of that in one place here. And that meant that uh, when r equals 2m, something funny was happening. Okay, what, what was happening wasn't exactly clear. Uh, the, uh, anyway, this is what's called the event horizon. It wasn't... It looked in, his, in the original formulation, it looked as if no, nothing could get through that uh, r equals 2m surface. In fact, that wasn't true, and uh, Sir Arthur Eddington very quickly showed that, hell, the coordinates were lousy. It was like using spherical polar coordinates instead of rectilinear coordinates. In another coordinate system, what you got was just flat space or Minkowski space plus a term. And by putting it in that form, what he could show was that uh, there was nothing funny happening at r equals 2m. The only thing about it was that you, once you went inside that event horizon, you couldn't get out. Uh, so that's the, that was the magical event horizon that you read about in the papers. Now, <coughs> what about... Could, could the Earth form a black hole? Could the Sun form a black hole? Well, <coughs> you can go as close as you like to the surface, but or this is what's said, but once you go inside, you can't return. In fact, if you go too close to that surface, you better get ready to, ready to accelerate away very quickly because the extraction of the... Uh, of the black hole at that point is extremely strong. So it isn't quite true that you can just blithely turn on the motors and sail away. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, now, if we took the sun and the earth and they were to collapse into black holes, the radius of the sun is uh, about three, would be about three kilometers and the radius for the Earth would be about one centimetre. So the Earth would collapse into a ball this size. Well, that's all very well, but <coughs> the density of the Sun at this point, as it collapsed into its event horizon, would be 20 billion billion kilo kilograms per cubic centimetre, denser than a neutron star. <coughs> now, what that actually means is that if you take the formation of a neutron star, which is when a sun has burnt up all of its possible energy and has become basically just a, what you've got left as a collection of neutrons, this, this final event occurs in a... Uh, uh, Oh, gee. sorry, I've, I had a, uh, I caught a virus coming over here and, and my brain isn't working too well. But <coughs> I, uh, anyway, 
neutron stars are extremely dense, but they're not as dense as that. So what uh, Chandrasekhar showed uh, quite a number of decades ago is that uh, a neutron star had a, if it was four solar masses, it would collapse into a black hole. If it was less than four solar masses, it wouldn't. It would stay, it would just be a neutron star. So <coughs> that uh, means that uh, this, this is too dense. Now, what about the Earth? Well, <laughs> I'm not even going to say how many zeros there are there. The Earth at that size would have an incredible density, quite impossible. So the Earth is never going to be a black hole. Our sun is never going to be a black hole. Actually, now I come to think of it, it could. If, it, if the sun accreted several more sun masses of, uh, of uh, stellar material somehow, then it could end up as a black hole. But that's not going to happen. I was told that last night by the great spaghetti monster. Uh, okay. Now, this, this is all back in the 1920s. Nobody believed there were any black holes around. Even neutron stars weren't understood in the, at that time. In fact, it wasn't realized that there, were, there was anything outside our galaxy until uh, about 1923. This is, this is a picture of the Andromeda galaxy. That was thought to just be a fuzzy bunch of stuff floating around in the solar system, so not the solar system, the, uh, uh, in our galaxy somewhere. But it wasn't realized until this time that it was actually extragalactic. Okay, so that was a big surprise. The next big surprise at that time was the Crab Nebula. You see, about a thousand years ago, the Chinese noticed a, uh, a supernova go off. Of course, they didn't know it was a supernova, but there was this new star appeared bright in the sky, and then after a few days, I think, it gradually disappeared. <coughs> in the early part of last century, it was finally, this crab nebula was discovered where, it, where the Chinese had said it was. And uh, of course, by now, it doesn't look anything like the remains of a star because there's been this huge supernova explosion. Everything's going out. And somewhere in there, we believe there's a black hole, but we can't see it. Okay, that was the sort of surprise people were getting in astrophysics and astronomy at that time. <coughs> well, the biggest surprise was yet to come. That was quasars. The uh, radio telescopes started up at the end of, or during World War II and at the end of World War II, then people, astronomers, started to use them to examine the universe and look for radio stars. And <coughs> the problem is that if you have a telescope and you use a certain frequency of light to, to uh, look at things through your telescope, the accuracy with which you can focus it depends upon the ratio of the the wavelength of the light to the size of the telescope. Now, these radio waves were pretty long compared to the, uh, the radio telescopes, and so they couldn't locate radio objects very clearly. Uh, <coughs> so so they, what they found was there were radio stars out there that were putting out a lot of energy but they didn't know which, were, which they were. They knew that this radio star must be associated to some visible star, perhaps, but 
which one? So, uh, oh, damn. So, they had to find the exact counterpart, the visible counterpart to a radio star. How could they do it? Well, the bright idea came up by Cyril Hazard and the other people mentioned here. They got the Parkes telescope down in Australia, and what th they knew that this uh, quasar, this radio star, was going to go behind the sun at some point. And they figured if they waited until it popped out on the other side, at the same time, a real star would pop out <laughs> and they'd identify them. Great. So they all got there. The only trouble was, when they came to do the observation, so this was popping out behind the moon, not the sun. When they came to do the observation, the moon was right down near the horizon. And the, ra the Parkes telescope doesn't go down near the horizon. It's used to look up into the sky. So <coughs> the uh, director got out his trusty spanner, a very large spanner, and unbolted the, uh, the mirror, the, uh, mirror or whatever you call it on a radio telescope, so it could drop down to the horizon. And <coughs> that way they found the optical uh, equivalent. It was this uh, quasar two, 3C273. It wasn't a star, it was a galaxy. So lo and suddenly they realized they're not looking at a tiny little star emitting a few radio waves. They're looking at a galaxy giga light years away emitting a hell of a lot of energy, an enormous energy, far more energy than they're seeing from a normal galaxy. And uh, <coughs> that, uh, that was a shock. Of course, Astrophysicists and astronomers love shocks because it means there's something good they can all get their teeth into for the next 50 years until it all proves to be nonsense and they have to shift to something else. Okay, here we go. Picture of Quasar. This is a radio picture. You might say, well, radio waves aren't pink. Of course they're not pink but I can't show you a picture of radio waves because your eyes don't see them. So whenever you have a, a picture of a quasar like this, the, free, the light frequency is shifted so we can actually see it. In the center is this quasar. These are jets shooting out, ending up in the... Uh, intergalactic media out here. <coughs> this, this picture was taken on the very, the LA, that's the very large array out in uh, uh, New Mexico, I think. And uh, my wife and I visited that a few years ago. The, uh, these are enormous. It, higher than this roof here. And uh, they go out 12 miles in each direction. There's a three rows of them. They're on little rails so that they can be moved back into, uh, into this area and worked on whenever something goes wrong. And although each telescope has only got a, uh, I don't know, 50, 100 meter uh, spread, all the telescopes together, thanks to clever computer work, act as one giant screen. So what we've got now is a 12, uh, a 12 kilometer radius screen, or it might even be miles. Okay. <coughs> Here we got quasars. This is 1960, 1962, big mystery. Where is the energy coming from? I mean, these things are putting out 
far more energy than you're going to get by burning a few uh, uh, hydrogen atoms into helium or whatever. It's, uh, nobody could figure it out. They, they, there was, a meeting was arranged in December 63 in Dallas, Texas, uh, to discuss it. And all the as astrophysicists and astronomers who were interested in this area, which was just about everybody, came along with about 50 relatives like, relativists like myself. And uh, a few years ago, I reread the book that was published after this meeting. And it was quite clear that at the end, there was no idea what was generating these quasars. They were completely um, just a mystery. Hoyle and Burbage suggested a giant star with a mass of a billion solar masses. But even then, all a giant star like that could do is burn hydrogen to helium or something like that. It, was, uh, it wouldn't put out the sort of energy they were seeing. No way. So, <coughs> OK. Well, it just so happens, and this was uh, really uh, a strange coincidence, uh, people had been looking for 30, 40 years for some way of getting Schwarzschild rotating, because every body in the universe rotates. It's impossible to stand still. I tried stand, standing still once, and I got a violent headache, and immediately I had to start wiggling around. So that's what everything does in the universe. It wiggles around. And <coughs> but Schwarzschild's solution didn't wiggle. No, no spin. So <coughs> the question was, amongst relativists, if you had a spinning spherical body, would it form a black hole or would it just be another, another solution? And <coughs> that question had been asked for a long time. And I'd, it happens that I came up with the answer just before this conference in the same year. And so I gave a, uh, a short talk during the meeting on rotating black holes, and the 300-odd <coughs> astrophysicists and astronomers who uh, weren't reading their paper or papers or talking were totally uninterested because this was just theoretical rubbish, you know, the sort of nonsense that relativists talk about amongst themselves, but real people don't listen to that. And... Uh, <coughs> And so most of them uh, just continued uh, reading their newspapers or whatever. And Pepper Petru, who had been working on that problem for a long, long time and had done some fantastic work on it, he started screaming at them and shaking his fists and said they should listen. They ignored him. <laughs> so, okay, last laugh. Within a year, it was realized that... If you have a rotating black hole, and it's then it will drag stuff around. There's this dragging effect. And so as matter falls in towards it, you get an accretion disk forming. And the amount of energy that you could generate by this accretion disk was enormous. And that solved the problem. So... Uh, <coughs> What was my solution like? It was very much like the solution that, uh, of uh, Swarthschild. Um, it had the same flat space there plus a square of a uh, light-like vector. Uh, when it had two parameters. Now, actually, this solution was the culmination of a whole lot of work by a whole lot of people, including Andre Troutman of your local university here, 
uh, he and uh, uh, and Ivor Robinson had produced a uh, a general class of solutions which couldn't include this one because they couldn't rotate. But uh, it was uh, what was called algebraically special. It was a special property of the curvature. And <coughs> it was a special property that every known physical solution had, which is why people were interested in general solutions like that. And so <coughs> I looked at the general problem and got to uh, a real mess at the end of equations. And then I... I was hunting for something physical in amongst it, and so I kept, I wanted something that was flat at infinity, a localized source, okay, and uh, it turned out that with all this work that had been done by all sorts of people, including myself, there was just this one possibility, two parameters, a mass and this other parameter A. So the question was, does it rotate when A is non-zero? OK. At the time, I told this Alfred Schuld, who was director of uh, the research centre in Austin that I was at that year, I, was I said, I'm going to my office to calculate the angular momentum. And uh, he said, fine, he's coming too, because we all wanted to know the answer. And uh, it was fairly quick, and the reason it was fairly quick was actually because of stuff I knew and work I'd done before on what were called the Einstein-Infeld-Hoffman equations. Now, there's a conference at the moment on, for Leopold Infeld, who died 50 years ago uh, on Monday, and... It just so happened that my work there meant that I was able to calculate the angular momentum in a very short time while, while he sat and smoked, and I smoked. We all smoked. Uh, finally, yes, it rotated. <coughs> that was, for all of us, was huge because that's, all of a sudden we had another model that we could use to investigate structures in the universe. You always, you've got to have simple models. There's no use having some complicated thing that, uh, with lots of parameters. <coughs> it, uh, here's a picture of it for what it's worth. It's got an event horizon. Anything comes in here, passes that surface, it will, it will very quickly drop into the inner surface when it's rotating those two surfaces and end up inside. Uh, since this solution is empty, there's no matter in it, it actually has got a ring singularity inside. But in practice, we really don't know what's inside the event horizon. We have no idea. Uh, there is a theorem that says that uh, there are geodesics of finite proper length because of it being a trapped surface. But uh, first of all, we don't know the physics of matter when it's compressed and compressed down to the sort of levels that we're talking about. We don't know the, the geometry of it. We don't know whether we can still talk in terms of uh, continuous, uh, a continuous geometry. So <coughs> it doesn't really matter because we're not going inside. I'm not going inside, and you do not want to either because if you go inside, you're not coming out. And there's no food in there that we know of. Uh, there may not even be vodka. I don't know. There's just nothing. So keep away from it. The, um, oh, here's a picture of a quasar. I'll show you a few pictures of quasars. And this one, this is 
just a new one discovered. It's, I believe this is the biggest quasar by far that's been found anywhere. It was just uh, released on <coughs> Scientific American. No, New Scientist, not Scientific American. There was a picture in New Scientist earlier last year. Uh, okay. Here's a... Oh, I never know if these are going to work. Here's a quasar going. How did we get a nice picture like this of a quasar working? Look at all the stuff flowing. God, hey. <laughs> it, it, it takes a million years to go from here to here. So quite clearly, this is not a picture we've taken because everything like this in the universe is pretty stationary in it, with respect to us. Now, this is just a, uh, an imaginary quasar. The, oh, blow, why don't, I didn't know that would work that. Uh, come on. Oh. Here's another picture of it. <coughs> what, what we've got here, actually, if I shine this on it, it's going to disappear, I think. You can see the accretion disk. Why is there a jet? Well, the only reason there can be a jet is that there's a gravitational field generated, or a very strong electromagnetic gravitational field, which uh, <coughs> appears to be... There, here's another one. These are going very quickly. This was one. This is uh, a model of one of the strongest quasars ever seen. <coughs> There's the black hole in the center, but around it is swirling all this garbage, stars, other matter. It's generated two two electromagnetic uh, jets, top and bottom. Not all quasars have jets, but. Uh, they're certainly very common. There's two things involved here. One is that uh, there are charged Kerr black holes. They're called Kerr-Newman black holes. They have charges on them. But there's also other solutions of the same type which have singularities along the axis uh, with electromagnetic fields. And <coughs> they're not quite black holes. So I'm not sure whether this truly is a black hole at the center with a, which has generated two spikes <coughs> or whether it's uh, something more complicated. We don't know. But everybody else thinks it's a black hole. So what, who am I to argue? I, I, I get $20 for every black hole people discover, of course. It's... <laughs> Part of a good thing. Here's some more pictures of uh, of quasars. <coughs> you see that they don't all have jets. Here is a picture of the jets coming out of a out of a quasar or several quasars. What you'll see is. I'm scared to point this at it in case it changes. Uh, this, here's the central black hole region, and then you're getting these pulses going out. So it's, uh, what it's doing, it's, that black hole at the center is, with its secretion disk, is, is accepting the gift of a star or two all of a sudden, and then burping out something. So I didn't make up the word burp, by the way. I read it in, uh, on the internet tonight for that's burping. So every so often, it burps out another bullet, another mass of 
Well, what? I don't know. Uh, <coughs> a plasma, probably. That's what we think it is. So we get these plasma jets or bolts flying out, eventually getting... Uh, these ones, I think, are getting absorbed by another body over here. It's done. <coughs> Where's the nearest quasar? Oh. Well, we don't really have a quasar in the center of the galaxy, but in the center of our galaxy is Sagittarius A star. And if I keep going closer and closer, let's see, now we're getting closer. In there, in our galaxy at the center, there's this bright spot, which is Sagittarius A star. Now, <coughs> we know there's a big mass there. How do we know that? Well, this is the reason. Look at this. Pictures were taken of the stars rotating around the center of the galaxy at that point. They were taken over a period of about 13 years. And pictures were taken every few days or whatever. And then that w they'd watch the stars move. And then they were plotted. And this is how they moved. There's one in particular... This one here, he went around the central object in uh, 13 years. Uh, this picture doesn't show it closing up, but it did out here. It closed up. Because it, it's like planets moving around the sun. You can calculate the mass of the sun, the force of the center, <laughs> that because from the uh, period and... Uh, and size of the, of the orbits. And so from that, it was computed that this is almost 4,000 times the mass of our sun. That's Sagittarius A star. <coughs> That's a 4 million solar masses is a lot of uh, mass. The only thing is, that's a midget in the center of our galaxy. Some galaxies have up to 20 billion solar mass objects in the center. 20 billion. Of course, that still is far less than the mass of a galaxy. Um, well, a, a galaxy can have 100 billion stars, and if they're all the size of ours, that's 100 billion solar masses anyway. So, <coughs> and some galaxies are bigger than that. So, there we see a, uh, that at the center of our galaxy, there's something. Now, is it, is it a black hole? Don't know of anything else that can be four billion solar masses, but what we want to do is get a picture of it. Now, how the hell do you take a picture at the center of the galaxy? The problem isn't that <coughs> that it's a long way away, because we can take pictures, or astrophysicists and astronomers can take pictures of objects far further away than the center of the galaxy. The problem is that the center of the galaxy is full of matter swirling around, dust and star stars collapsing. and it's <coughs> You can't see into the center with ordinary light. And so you have to use something else. And right now, I can't remember whether that's uh, uh, what exact form of light it is, but we'll call us Z-rays. You use Z-ray telescopes all over and you look in. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, there's an international project sent up where a whole lot of telescopes are simultaneously looking at this central object Okay, so we have an array of telescopes spread over thousands of miles apart. Okay. 
And <coughs> they have been taking pictures, and sooner or later in the next year, we're going to get uh, the results of this, and with any luck, we'll get a picture of what's at the center. I heard that they had stopped taking pictures and they were just processing the data. So far, nothing seems to have come out, so uh, I don't know whether it was, a f it was a bit of a flop and that they didn't see, see what they hoped to see. We'll, we'll know sooner or later. They'll tell us. So <coughs> that's one of the things that people are looking to do. Uh, the, um, get a picture of the object. Are there other black holes? Yeah, what about uh, all, just a little black hole? They don't all have to be 20 billion solar masses. Those are the monsters at the center of galaxies. What about uh, if a, uh, a large star collapses? And I, I mean, it's, you get stars that can be as large as uh, 100 solar masses. I mean, there are claims there are even heavier stars than that, but very often these claims disappear after a while. But at least 100 solar masses exist. Now, a star like that burns up very, very quickly. It's, it's only a question of a few million years, and it's, it's gone through all its fuel, will form a supernova, and <coughs> when the, everything explodes out, what's left, the core, is a, basically a neutron star. But if that neutron star is more than four million, four solar masses, it's not stable, it will collapse into a black hole. So we expect there to be ordinary black holes around. Now, <coughs> the first known black hole in our galaxy was Cygnus X1. What that is, this is just, again, we don't have a, a decent picture to show us exactly what's happening there, but uh, you've got a supergiant very hot, a close-by black hole. Matter is accreting onto the black hole from, uh, from the supergiant. It's, uh, when two star stars like that get too close together, matter will flow from one to the other onto the accretion disk and forming a, uh, an X-ray binary. And Ramo Ruffini showed that in, uh, I haven't got a date here, but I think it was about 71 that this was actually a black hole here. Don't ask me how he did it. I don't know. He might have asked the giant spaghetti monster. The <coughs> anyway, that appears to be a black hole. Have we seen any other black holes? Yeah. How did we see them? Through uh, gravitational uh, uh, waves. So, this brings me to colliding black holes. Here's a simulation. Now, why the hell is all this stuff going like crazy around those central black holes? Well, that's not stuff that's going crazy. That's stars behind that you're looking at. But the geometry is such that the rays from the stars are getting distorted as they come by and bent. And so they, they're all over the place. And <coughs> <coughs> that's... Uh, can we observe that? There was a Nobel Prize given, or three of them were given in this last year, for uh, LIGO. Now, LIGO is exactly like the Michelson-Morley experiment. It's just Michelson-Morley. Instead of being on a tabletop, it's got several kilometer arms. But what's happening is that 
you've got two perpendicular arms, okay, <coughs> and you split a light beam into two parts. One goes along one arm, actually goes back and forth a hundred times, okay, and then the other one does the same on the other arm, and then interference is used to find out if there's a difference. And you follow this in time, so you gradually get a... If one of those arms is shorter than the other momentarily, if, if there's some sort of wave going through, you would expect to see a wave in the uh, interference effect. Now, what sort of measurement accuracy do they need? A fraction of an atomic diameter of a ridiculously small. So, either it is the most fantastic experiment in the history of mankind, which is a good possibility, or else it's all a fake, but I think it's probably not a fake, and there was this technology was incredible. The, that uh, LIGO <coughs> has observed three or four different events where two black holes have merged. Now, the, in order to calculate what happens to the waves as those black holes merge, you start with the two bodies are quite a long way apart. Until they get very close together, the work of Infeld, the uh, Einstein-Infeld-Hoffman approach does the job very well. This, the approximation is a good approximation initially. When the bodies get close together, it becomes highly nonlinear, and numerical mathematics is then used to try and solve what's happening at that point. Uh, but I think looking at the results, they're actually mostly getting observable results from, the, from when the two bodies are still reasonably far apart. So Enfeld's work has, has been very instrumental in, in uh, being able to do this experiment. Um, Okay, I said I was going to give a few words to young students. The beauty of physics is that <coughs> it doesn't matter what theory you've got today, it's likely to disappear tomorrow. Now, if you go back to the 19th century, well, people believed in the ether theory. There was this fixed ether and everything moved in it. They believed in instantaneous action at a distance, they disappeared when Einstein came along and his colleagues. Now, but we still have left over from the 18th and 17th century the concepts of energy. Energy disappeared with general relativity. It's only an approximation. When people talk about conservation of energy in a, in a general relativistic system, they're saying that, well, there's, there's this approximately good idea energy, which if we fix the coordinates and keep everything very simple, we can deduce a few things about a system. And it's very useful there. But energy itself is no longer well-defined. And <coughs> the other great classical thing was entropy. You know, ent entropy uh, and uh, thermodynamics, which you all studied in, uh, when you did physics, at, uh, even in undergraduate school. Uh, <coughs> the trouble with entropy and talking about the how entropy increases or decreases in the universe, the trouble is that entropy, there is no definition of entropy 
in a general system, and certainly not in the universe. So we're not ever somebody who's making a name for themselves as an entropist, if that's a word. Whenever I talk to them, I always ask them, what is the definition for the entropy of the universe? Is it? Of course, there's none. So that concepts like entropy may, may disappear in the future. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, the trouble comes when you try and take general relativity and classical notions and put them in together, like quantum, classical quantum field theory and general relativity have not been put together. We don't understand what happens. And yet, uh, we have people claiming that uh, they can prove things, that, like the evaporation of black holes and so on. Well, I better stop there. That's uh, my 50 minutes, and thank you for listening. Yeah. <coughs> I'll be pleased to answer any questions if I can. Yeah, there is some time for questions now, so well, we can start here. Thank you very much for the lecture. I came here today to ask you this question. So, is this now, now it's obvious that two black holes can rotate? and eventually they merge. And in this process, the gravitational wave is emitted. Uh, sorry, my hearing is lousy. Okay, so yes. two black holes yes. can mix into one, they merge, yes. and the gravitational wave is emitted. Yes. My question is, can this process be reversed in time? No, no. Thank you very much. It's not time reversal. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, collapse into one black hole is not time reversal. The, uh, <coughs> okay, there is a question just upstairs. Hello, uh, my name is Paul. Uh, thank you uh, in the first place uh, for this great lecture. Uh, my question is about black holes, obviously. Uh, I would like to, uh, I would like to, to ex uh, extend the, the last uh, sentence of, of, of your speech uh, about the evaporation of the black holes, because we know from the quantum uh, theory that the black holes uh, evaporate through, through the um, Hawking radi radiation. Uh, okay. But what is the end state of, of, of this uh, process? Uh, does it overwhelm uh, okay. uh, with gravity? In 1970-something, I read Hawking's first paper on evaporation of black holes. Okay? And what was clear from this, that paper was that the, evapor the uh, quantum mechanical effect was crucially dependent upon the boundary condition on R equals 2M, on the on the boundary. Now, uh, <laughs> I'm having trouble remembering names. Um, the, uh, it was shown with Swarthschild that this, this idea that there was something mystical about the boundary was not re really correct, and there were perfectly good coordinate systems that covered the outside and the inside with no, no singularities there at all at the boundary. And yet, in, in Hawking's paper, it was clearly dependent upon this boundary condition that he put on, because he used uh, a coordinate system in which the, the surface was... Uh, was singular in those coordinates. Um, the, uh, now, I think the same method was used to look at accelerating 
coordinate systems in special relativity, and it was found that, gee, you could get uh, the, same, the Hawking effect if you had an accelerating coordinate system. Well, what that meant, if you, whenever you talk about an accelerating coordinate system, even without reading the paper, I know damn well there's going to be a surface at which the coordinate system is singular. And they're going to have to decide what is the value of the field on this singular surface. Okay, well, it, and that will not be as obvious as they think. And so I don't believe, I, I think that actually is the fact that this classical analog exists, I think, is the strongest evidence against the Hawking effect. Anyway, it's all dependent upon a theory of quantum mechanics in curved space and, a rela and the connection between quantum field theory and general relativity, which hasn't been solved. So what, you, what you've got is a conjectures about <coughs> if this part of quantum mechanics is okay and that part of general relativity is okay and we forget about these other bits, we get we get this evaporation of black holes, and it's going to take 10 to the 83 million trillion years or something, some enormous time anyway. So, uh, you've got to remember in physics, if a whole class of researchers don't have anything much to talk about, they've got to talk about what they, what they have, and what we've got here is a whole lot of researchers who are talking about evaporation of black holes which has no experimental verification. So, I don't know. <laughs> don't ask me. <laughs> I'm a cynic. Yeah. Okay, there is a question from the left. Yep. Um, um, thank you for the lecture. My question is maybe a little bit off the main topic a bit of yeah. the black holes, but it's about the opening of your lecture, about the Michelson-Morley experiment. Do you see the same problem in physics education and popularization, apart from the undeserved credit of uh, black holes evaporation, that this experiment and this history and the history of special relativity are very often misunderstood, they are very, very easy to misunderstand, and there are at least five very common misconceptions. For example, that it disproved ether, or that uh, it proved the speed of light in vacuum to be entirely invariant, yeah. or that it wasn't explained. Sorry, slow down and let me get closer so I can hear you. Okay. So, Do pro I? probably the five most common misconceptions about yes. Michelson model experiment is that it disproved the ether, or that it proved the speed of light in vacuum to be completely invariant, mm. or that it's, it proved the, the, the speed limit, or that it was a, wasn't explained until special relativity, or that special relativity is the only explanation of the experiment, mm. or that it was the main goal of Einstein to explain this experiment. Do you see the same, do you find it a problem, and if so, do you think it's important to fix, and is, 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 is there a way to fix it? like those misconceptions? Uh, hmm. <coughs> the, uh, when, whenever you have discussions about the Michelson-Morley ex experiment, there were a number of uh, attempts to explain it, and they had to do with the uh, shrinking of uh, moving bodies along one axis, and and, uh, <coughs> and it is possible that some of those theories might have been right, and, and Einstein's theory might have been wrong in the end. But the, all the experimental evidence later on seemed to be on Einstein's side, and uh, so the notion of the shrinking of... Uh, of the bodies uh, perpendicular to the motion, etc., uh, that's disappeared. <coughs> Actually, uh, one thing I might as well say: What does a body look like when it goes past you very fast? 
Now, we've all seen pictures of tigers going through forests, and the tigers are very short. That's all total rubbish. Roger Penrose showed that if you have a ball going by, a sphere going by fast, you know, relative compared to the velocity of light, it looks exactly like a ball when it goes by. It stays spherical, a circular. Uh, this was uh, one of the first things Roger ever did, and uh, it was a lovely little result. And if you, I, I remember once solving a problem for a friend of mine in a, in a, a course. He was asked, what does a triangular sail on a boat look like if it's going by very fast? <coughs> I would hate to have been in that wind, but... Uh, and of course, he was supposed to use the, the, uh, the contraction, and, uh, but I calculated exactly what it would look like for him. And basically, it was pretty much the same as it... You know, it, it didn't change shape, except the lines became a bit curved. And it's all because of the finite speed of the light, because when you look at something going by, you're actually looking at the photons that leave it at various times and get to your eye simultaneously, because that's the picture you take. So if one part of the boat is further away, the light has got to leave that part of the boat before the closer bits of the boat to get to you at the same time. So it's, it's very complicated what things look like there. But I don't know if that answers your question, but I've probably evaded it <laughs> somehow. <laughs> Since I didn't hear it. <laughs> okay. Excuse me. What would, what would be a difference between a collision of uh, two Kerr black holes and a collision of two Kerr Newman black holes? Because in this case, we have additional degree of freedom uh, charges of these two black holes. And probably we have also very interesting things connected to the radiation of uh, Electromagnetic right. waves, yeah. also gravitational yeah. waves, or not? I agree with you 100%. It's going to be very complicated. How come it hasn't been calculated? How do we know that those objects that have been observed by LIGO were actually uncharged black holes and not charged? We don't know. Uh, don't, so... <laughs> You know, you don't have to know everything in life to get by. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> and uh, they're happy. They got their Nobel Prizes. <laughs> and deservedly. The experiment is, is colossally accurate to, to get to where they go. It's unbelievable. <coughs> Any Going back to the, uh, to the to your original solution for the car rotating black hole, yeah. can you tell a little bit more about the physical implications of your uh, solution for the metric? How does the car black hole behave, and how does matter behave around the black uh, car black hole? Well, <coughs> I guess what what was found once the astrophysicists got hold of it, because they wanted to explain the, the quasars, uh, what they realized was that <coughs> if that... Uh, there's, there's a maximum spin it can have. Basically, it can't spin faster than the velocity of light. So uh, there's two parameters. If one of them is too big, it's non-physical. But... Uh, what we see in practice is that that parameter is very close to its maximum. A lot of these black holes are spinning at close to the maximum speed they can have. Now, <coughs> what you get around it is a, uh, an area where you cannot sit still. You are dragged, you are forced to rotate with the black hole. Okay. And... Uh, <coughs> because that's 
is why the, you get these accretion disks, stars. Matter comes, if it went straight into the center of the black hole, then it wouldn't necessarily form an accretion disk, but nothing goes straight in. So what you get are uh, stars which, uh, which get close to the center of the black hole, get caught up in the accretion disk, and then start being forced to rotate around. Um, the, uh, uh, one beauty of the Kerr solution was that anything you want to calculate, if the original theory could be calculated. For one, one thing, you would like to know how do the geodesics move. Okay, if, there is a, if there's an accretion disk, it's all a mess. But if you've just got a black hole and a, another one body going around, it's going to go on a geodesic. Uh, it was very quickly shown that, uh, that you could calculate the geodesics, which you can't do for most solutions of the Einstein equations. That was one thing. Um, another one, which I didn't mention, was are there any other black holes? No. It, soon after I found my solution, uh, an Australian and a New Zealander uh, proved that uh, there are no other black holes. Uh, um, it's sometimes been expressed as black holes have no hair. There's no extra structure that you can have. And that's, that's why the solution was so important, because <coughs> Otherwise, there could have been quadrupole moments and octopole moments and other structures on the black hole, but there aren't any. And uh, as the body collapses into the black hole, it loses all its extra structure. It's only left with its mass and angular momentum and charge. So uh, it was really a... It's really a great tool for calculating everything, anything, because of its uniqueness. Um, <coughs> I mean, in Newtonian physics, we're stuck with an Earth that's got mountains and <laughs> valleys, and uh, it's not quite spherical. It's, uh, uh, it's got bumps and lumps all over. But you can't have that with a black hole. No bumps and lumps. Okay, well, it seems we have uh, two more questions, so maybe we can ask uh, those two. Well, my question is sort of related to the previous one. Uh, when we have a uh, rotating black hole, yeah. there is a region of space around it, I think it's called an ergosphere, yeah. Yeah? where you can still escape. It's beyond the event horizon, yeah. so theoretically you can escape from the black hole, and I I think it was Penrose who suggested that it takes away, you can take away from the angular momentum of the black oh, hole. Yeah. So, yeah. my question is, would it be possible for a rotating black hole to slow down and stop rotating? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Here we've got a rotating black hole. Okay, well, which way? No, I'll go that way around. Okay, it's going that way around. I fire something in at an angle, counter to the rotation. That's going to decrease the angular momentum. Okay, so you can decrease the angular momentum of, uh, obviously, of, of a black hole, and you can keep doing that. The <coughs> uh, but you can't decrease its, uh, its mass. That's, uh, that's, uh, what, sorry, oh, sorry, I can't remember its name. It's irreducible mass. There's an irreducible mass which uh, it's got, and that can only increase. So, uh, uh, no, the angular momentum's not really as fixed as the, uh, as the irreducible mass. Uh, so can you get energy out of the system? Well, you can use a process like that to get out energy. As, uh, but I'd prefer, actually, to pl 
plug into the local el electricity system if I want some energy. Uh, <coughs> I mean, using black holes to do anything is uh, a little bit difficult since we don't want to get within a billion miles of them if we can help it. Um, so, uh, are there black holes flying around in our solar system? Well, I think we would notice the effect on the, on the planets if there was a big black hole floating around. <coughs> Usually, the orbits of the planets are checked very accurately, and if there are discrepancies, people start looking for the missing planet, which has been done in the past. And now there's, uh, there's been some claims of some giant planet out a long way away, but um, uh, I think we would pick up a black hole if it was in close. Uh, but if that is... <coughs> <coughs> See, we know how to create... Uh, we know how... B small black holes can be created, but they're all solar mass size anyway. They're all uh, four solar masses or so. You, if they're smaller than that, you get neutron stars. Bigger than that, you can get black holes. There's no small black holes. Um, you could say, well, at the start of the universe, <laughs> the giant spaghetti monster spread around a whole lot of... Uh, miniature little baby black holes just to annoy the hell out of us. I don't know. That, I can't argue with arguments like that, even if I made it myself. Um, so uh, <coughs> we, don't, we don't really believe there are black holes around. Uh, some people would have claimed that dark matter could be a whole lot of black holes we don't have experimental evidence for that, so I'm not going to comment. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Oh. I, I doubt if that had anything to do with your question, but if it did, thanks. Okay, so the final question, it seems so, well, also from the left. Okay, so uh, at the end of your lecture, you mentioned the possibility of overthrowing or going beyond concepts like energy and entropy yes. instead of incorporating them into the theories of gravity. Uh, only just a minute ago you mentioned uh, the dark matter and the, yes. and the problems it, it generates. There, there, are, there are many theories of gravity, relativistic theories of yeah. gravity, different from GR, yes. Yes. And which are consistent with experiment and some of them I mean, are designed specific, have been designed specifically to eliminate or reduce the quantity of dark matter. I wonder, do you have a favorite the theory alternative to general relativity? Because for the long time, the main competitor was Brand's Dickey theory, but it has been somehow, it has somehow faded away. No, I, sorry, I have no idea. I don't. You, so you I, don't have a favorite? I don't have a favorite other theory because I don't know of any other theory that, uh, that works as well as, as GR. The, uh, <coughs> there's these problems with dark energy and dark matter. They, uh, <coughs> clearly we don't understand what's going on. But to a, to a large extent, they come back to measuring the uh, expansion of the universe. And to a lot of uh, things like... Uh, how good are our standard candles? How well can we measure stuff? Um, the, uh, there are other ways of measuring the expansion and the, uh, uh, the radius of the... Or, it's hard to call it radius. The spread of the universe as a function of time. There are other ways of measuring it which don't necessarily agree with the, uh, uh, the standard methods of uh, calculating uh, 
how the uh, things like dark energy and dark matter. So we'll have to wait and see. We could all be in for big surprises in the next century. Uh, some of you might be lucky and see the next century. <laughs> Actually, some of you will. I'm sure by the uh, time... So I'm sure that there'll be plenty of people born in the year 2100, uh, no, 2000, not 2100, who live past the year 2100, so the way things are going. So. But th it's good. It doesn't matter if theories come and go. That's what makes physics so exciting. It, uh, you know, if everything had to stay the same as the Romans thought it was, gee, then you'd have to take up another subject instead of physics. But here we've got, uh, uh, we have theories that, uh, you know, a physical theory is just a way of calculating the future for some, some experiment or some object. Uh, <coughs> you, you never know why that method works. I mean, why, why on earth should bodies move along geodesics in a uh, general relativistic world. No idea. It's, uh, but by assuming they do, we can calculate out some things which seem to agree with experiments. So that's good. And uh, I think I'm going to have to finish now. <laughs> right. Okay, so let us thank <laughs> Professor Kerr again. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank My you so God, much. those are beautiful. Well, thank you. And I, I caught a uh, virus coming over a week or so ago, and uh, so. I'm even more stupid than normal, but I've tried to answer your questions as best I can. And thank you. Can I give these to my wife? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> what, can I, what can I say, darling? They're yours. <laughs> okay. <laughs>